Beautiful change makers. Hello from the gorgeous tropical paradise of Koh Samui. This is Lorna Lee, your host for Entrepreneurs for Change, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day to be inspired by the stories and in the trenches advice from the world changing guests that I have on this show. I'm on day five of a seven day detox cleanse. Now, this is the first time in my life that I've gone without solid food for so long, and you know what? It feels amazing. I'm incredibly energized and clear minded. This beats caffeine, which, let me tell you, as a total coffee addict, caffeine dependency can be a downward spiral of negative returns. One of the things I've become very aware of during this detox is how heavy food is for our bodies to process, especially if we're eating processed foods that are full of chemicals. Commercial produce that is laden with pesticides and animal products that are full of antibiotics and hormones. Even if you only eat organic, if you aren't combining foods correctly, Google food combining to learn more about this, your body actually burns more energy trying to digest the food than it is actually getting from the food. If you ever feel like taking a siesta after eating a burrito, that's what I'm talking about. So if you're an entrepreneur that is into hacking the body and mind for optimal performance, consider doing a detox retreat. So getting back to our podcast, my special guest for today is Lisa Fabrega, who is a multiple six-figure coach, writer, and leadership innovator. Lisa believes that every time you hold back, self-sabotage, and keep yourself from stepping into the leadership you know you were born to embody, you are affecting the fate of the world because you are removing a key player that assists in its evolution, you. Her purpose is to help people unleash their inner Gandhi, Mother Teresa, or Martin Luther King's or helping ordinary people achieve extraordinary things so that they can make a powerful impact in the world. For this reason, Lisa's clients call her the courage curator and refer to her as the secret weapon for the world's next great thought leaders. In this powerful interview, Lisa will share with us how she built her multiple six-figure business from a 500-person email list. Tips and strategies on how you can authentically share your truth and connect with your audience. Her gracious and evolved technique for handling negative comments and feedback from people in your social media communities. What life purpose means to her. What it takes to effectively change the world as an entrepreneur. And much, much more in the masterclass, which you can download for free at entrepreneursforchange.com slash 52, Lisa will share with us her blueprint for creating a high level mastermind program that is successful and profitable. Signs that your community is ready to embrace a premium mastermind program. The best time in your business growth to roll out this high level mastermind. The most important criteria you need to consider when designing a transformational mastermind program. How long it will realistically take to plan your high-level mastermind program from concept to launch. Smart, savvy advice on how to avoid incurring financial losses on your mastermind retreat and tips on how to stay within your budget. Tools, people, and resources mentioned in the interview can be found in the show notes at entrepreneursforchange.com slash 52. Are you ready to be the change? If so, you've come to the right place. You are about to join a movement of entrepreneurs who are empowering people, saving the planet, and turning their passion into profits while creating the lifestyle of their dreams. If you don't believe us, check out our website at entrepreneursforchange.com, a place where you can be inspired, mentored, and supported by a tribe of change-making entrepreneurs just like you. Now, before diving into the interview, I want to encourage you to rate, review, and download Entrepreneurs for a Change on iTunes. This really helps us reach more people with inspiring stories of entrepreneurs who are changing the world. Also, if these stories inspire you to start a world-changing business of your own, head over to our website at entrepreneursforachange.com and download the Business Changemakers Toolkit to get a jump start today. Now, on to the show. Hello there, Lisa. It's such a pleasure to have you with me on this podcast. I am so impressed with the success that you have been able to achieve as a um, business coach. I'd love to find out more about how we might be able to replicate that success. So let's kick it off by first starting off 
by introducing yourself to our audience. Who are you and what is your business? Sure. So I'm Lisa Fabrega. I'm the founder of lisafabrega.com. And uh, I'm, I'm a writer and a coach. And uh, my client, some of my clients call me a courage curator. <laughs> um, and basically what I do is I help you get rid of all the stuff, all the fear, anxiety, limiting beliefs that are holding you back from becoming the powerful leader that you know you are meant to be in the world so that you can make a, a big change and a big impact in the world around you. So who are the clients that you tend to work with? Um, they tend to be entrepreneurs, men or women, uh, who either are leaving an old project and an old business and starting a new one, um, and they're afraid because the new one tends to be more aligned with who they are, and they're going to be more visible uh, fully as themselves versus hiding behind a brand name or something like that. And so they're looking to just make sure that they can really hold that container for such large audiences and make sure that what they're putting out there really is who they are versus some sort of um, version of a business that would, people would like, but it's not necessarily something they want to keep up long term. Or it can also be people who are just starting out and have had success in other areas and they're feeling called to start their own thing, uh, a more purpose-based business. And, you know, all the fears and, and the, the doubts that come up along the way in terms of being visible, just fully standing in your truth of who you are, um, I work with those as well. And once we get past those, then it's deciding what type of a leader do you want to be? Um, what's an alignment for you? What's the exact type of impact you want to be making in the world? And how do we get you aligned with that in a way that feels authentic to you? So what inspired you to become an entrepreneur, especially one who helps other entrepreneurs overcome fears, anxieties, and limiting beliefs? Um, was it a gradual uh, progression or did you have an aha moment that led you to decide to start the business that you have now? Oh, for sure. I mean, when I first started my business, I was an actor uh, in New York City. And the, the reason I even decided to start my own business was that I never even knew that I had the potential to do that. I was still very much in that mindset of if you need money, you do a nine to five. And I didn't know that I could actually be the creator of my own financial abundance. And so a friend of mine who was also an actor came up to me and said, you know, I've been, I started this coaching business and it's going really well. And I've been able to stop working at my nine to five job just to pay my bills. And this, you know, this is really flexible. I'm my own boss. I can go on my auditions whenever I want to. And I thought, oh, well, if she can do that. I want to do that. <laughs> and so I actually enrolled in the coaching school that she had gone to. And it was a huge risk for me. It was a huge risk. It was very scary because I, at the time, was I had just been laid off of my job. And um, I was living on unemployment, desperately trying to find another job. And I remember I had to borrow money to pay for the coaching school. And the night before I signed up for the coaching school, it just felt like such a huge leap and such a huge decision. And I knew it was going, this decision was just going to make an impact. I didn't know if it was going to be negative or positive, but you know, when you can feel the impact of a decision. And so I remember I cried <laughs> the night that I called to sign up for the school because I was so terrified. And I kept thinking, you know, how, you know, how is this going to work? And what if I suck? What if I fail? And then I'm now I'm going to be like 9,000 in the hole from the school. And I did it anyway. And I started my business as right before I graduated from my coaching school and just started hustling to get clients. And for the first two years, my business did not so, not, not so badly. I mean, you know, it was just the natural progression of a business owner. And I was a, you know, I've always been a hustler. I always have worked been willing to do the work to get to where I need to go. But I started to notice towards the end of the second year that the, that my message had been changing. And what I had actually done is when I had started my business, I had just picked what I thought would be most popular based on what I was seeing around me. And I had followed like the templates that other people had followed. And what was happening is it had gotten me a certain level of success, but it wasn't the type of success that I was craving. Um, and I was working these like 12, 14 hour days and I wasn't pulling in the amount of money that I should have been pulling in for working that hard. And there were all these things that I had been longing to say to my audience. I was having these incredible transformational experiences with my clients as I was working with them privately. 
And because it didn't quite, because my brand was evolving behind the scenes, but it didn't quite fit in with the brand or the the business I had built, I was holding back all of this juicy stuff. And for me, I have to speak my truth or literally my body gets sick uh, until I do. And that's exactly what happened. I went to visit my parents for a holiday and when I got to my parents' house, I got violently sick. I was so sick, I had to lie in bed for a week and I could not get out of bed. And it wasn't even the kind of sick where you can like watch reruns of How I Met Your Mother and while you're in bed. No, no. it was the kind of sick where all I could do was look up at the ceiling. And that really forced me to be with myself and to to really like have a a reckoning with myself as to what I was unhappy with and what I was what I was happy with and what was working and what wasn't working. And I realized how miserable I was and how I just wanted to quit and how fed up I was working so hard, not having a life. Um, and, you know, like holding back all of the stuff that I wanted to be sharing with my community because it didn't quote unquote fit in with my brand. And so I kind of just had like this breaking point where I was like, screw this. I'm, if I don't say what I want to say, I'm quitting because it's not worth it to feel this way. And so I remember um, when I started to feel a little bit better, I just started to pour out all the stuff I've been wanting to say for years about all the different topics. And a lot of it was business related. And I didn't start out as a business coach. So I was afraid that people would sort of like pick it me for <laughs> trying to talk about business. because Those are all the types of silly fears that we have. And I did my first Facebook post and it was just like pure, like my truth. Like, this is what I think. This is what I feel. And I'm tired of people doing this to themselves. And within minutes, I had more likes and more comments than I'd ever had. Uh, People started going nuts over my daily posts and my whole business exploded. Um, And it has turned into a very successful multi six figure, little mini empire that continues to grow. And you know, for me, it's not even about the income. For me, it's about the fact that the work I'm doing now, it just feels so damn good because it's so aligned with who I am. I get to, my, like, my brand gets to be who I am and people love that and the people who don't are just not my client. And because I am just who I am fully in my branding and, and everything I say and do, number one, it's much easier. So I don't work as hard as I used to. I have much more free time because I know exactly what to say. And number two, it it has attracted the most perfect clients for me. So whereas before I used to have clients that would sometimes just drain me and didn't feel like the right fit, but it's like I have a business and I have to keep it going. And maybe this is just the way it is with all clients. Now I know when, you know, whenever I'm going to get on the phone with a client or with a group, because mostly I coach in high level groups now, I just get so excited now because I love the people that are going to be on the call. I love my community. I love the people who get my newsletter. I love the people that I speak to on Facebook. Um, So that's been my journey. Wow. So um, you started off as a different kind of coach. What were you helping people with then? And how were you able to transition to business from, from uh, from a different demographic from where you started? Yeah, so I started as an emotional eating coach, which is really hysterical to me now that I look back on it. And I probably did that for about a year. And then what started to emerge was that I thought, well, you know, I'm kind of not too crazy about the emotional eating thing. Um, So I'm just going to, I also had an incredible amount of knowledge uh, about detox because I had used detox to heal my body of all sorts of illnesses that I had. And So I thought, well, maybe I I need to be a detox coach. And so I became a detox coach and I got a little more recognition for that because it was what was popular at the time. Um, But again, notice how I was making decisions on what was popular at the time, not on what am I really truly called here to do. And um, what started to happen for me is that I noticed that all my clients, once they got the food part down, which was, you know, these are smart women, you know, smart people, smart men and women, they're not going to... You know, they'll get it after a couple sessions and then they know what they need to do. Um, and then all sorts of other stuff started coming out in our sessions. And then most of my clients, for some reason or other, have always been entrepreneurs. And a lot of people on my list at the beginning were peers who had gone to school with me who were curious about what I was doing. And so I always kind of had a group of, of wannabe or current entrepreneurs following me no matter what I was doing. And what started happening is my clients that were came to me for detox work started really talking to me about their lives and then their businesses. And because I was building a business, I had expertise. I, I knew what it was like to be in the trenches. 
And um, in the third year of my business, the way I made the transition is literally like I explained to you. It was like plunging into the cold Arctic waters. <laughs> it was like I'm fed up. And I'm finally going to start talking about business because that's what I've been seeing people be so out of alignment in. And my clients are coming and talking to me about their businesses. And everybody who's coming to talk to me is a person who has a calling. And the way that translates into our world today is it's basically starting your own business or starting your own project or your own thing. And um, so, yeah, so I just I didn't really even make a transition. I just jumped right in with my first Facebook post and I started talking about it. And then people started coming to me for it. And lo and behold, I had a very a good talent for it, which I didn't even know I did. So that's how I made the transition. Okay, so I'm so curious about how you walk the fine line between sharing yourself authentically on Facebook and you know publicly through social media and if you have any tips on how to do this because you know sometimes you know for me personally it's uh, unclear like how authentic I need to be as both a business person and also within my community about some things that might be going on in my life versus whether I need to self-censor because of being somewhat of a public official so do you have any tips on how to share yourself authentically in such a way that allows vulnerability to come through in such a way that connects with your audience, but doesn't necessarily um, give the wrong impression or vibe, so to speak. Yeah, so um, I think there's two ways to answer the question. Number one is that if you're overly thinking about how to be authentic, you're missing the whole point. If you're trying to figure out how to be vulnerable, you're missing the whole point <laughs> because it's not something we can calculate. Vulnerability and authenticity is just who you are. But that being said, you know, it's not like we're going to go on and vomit everything that's on our mind, even when we're having a bad day onto social media, because we're, if you know, it, when it comes down to it, we're here to serve our audience. And so there are stories from my life. I mean, I'm very vulnerable and super transparent with my people. Um, and some people haven't liked it and too bad. You're not my audience then. Um, because my message for my people is to live authentically and to be who you are. And so if I'm holding back, then I'm not walking my talk and it's my responsibility to be a mirror of that, a mirror of that for my people. But at the same time, you know, I, I had a friend many years ago who kind of started her business kind of started falling apart and she was sharing all of her Facebook, uh, all of her fears and her freak outs. And I finally sent her a message and I'm like, listen, I don't think you're actually being helpful to your audience by doing this. So that's like an example of just saying everything without considering how it's affecting your audience. So the questions I always ask myself before I share is not how I, I don't ask myself how I'm going to look because for me, it's not about me. It's about my people. So that's the first thing I would say. It's not about you. It's about them. Number two, ask yourself, is this going to serve my people? Like, is this really going to serve? So there are stories from my life that are really compelling stories, but they really don't serve. Like, until I find a way that they're going to serve my people, there's no point in telling them. Um, and number two is you have to ask yourself, do I want to contribute to expansion in the world or do I want to contribute to contraction in the world? And if you're here to make an impact, a positive impact, if you're here to to help people, then most likely you're here to contribute to expansion. And you have to be very aware of the fact that when you're in a public position, when people are seeing you, you do have an added responsibility of weighing your words heavily. And I don't mean holding back and suppressing who you are. I mean, is what I'm about to say, is what I'm about to write to a large form of people going to expand or contract them? Um, and I think that's a really good check to do of yourself. Um, and that's what I do before I post anything. You know, my posts are very edgy. My posts push buttons on purpose to expand you, but I'm not going to go on and, you know, write a paragraph about when I'm in a really bad mood about how I hate the world, because what purpose does that serve? <laughs> it serves no purpose. It just is complaining on Facebook. Um, and my, my vision for my people is to uplift them and empower them so me having a crappy day and bitching about it on Facebook is not really going to serve my people because that's not empowering them or uplifting them. It's just them having to take in more 
verbal garbage from somebody <laughs> on Facebook. So those are sort of the questions I ask myself. How do you deal with trolls? Let's say if you do post something edgy and somebody um, comes onto your uh, update and actually starts to um, uh, get really aggressive with you. Do you, um, how do you handle um, uh, commentary like that in the public? Eye? Yeah. Well, I get it all the time. You know, I get, I get, uh, one time I was advertising a free teleclass I was doing and it was hysterical. I don't know what was in the air during that week, but the hate comments I was getting were just insane. I was laughing so hard because they were just horrible. I mean, they were just making comments about my weight, my appearance. I mean, nothing to do with the, with the teleclass I was promoting. Um, uh, one woman, the class was about how to, you know, the class was something like, um, how to make more money doing what you love. It was something similar to that. And this woman wrote something like, you're everything that's wrong with this world. F off with your disgusting money. Like Just really mean, <laughs> angry comments. And here's the way I see it. When it first used to happen to me, I used to get so hurt and so upset. And I think most people are afraid that will happen. And so they'd rather just not playful out or be really who they are because they're afraid that's going to happen. But the first thing you have to understand is that it's not personal. Um, everything that person is saying to you is just a projection and a reflection of the struggles they're going through. So for example, that woman who made that comment about the money and told me I was everything that was wrong and whatever, I bet you that she was having a deep struggle with money and was probably very, you know, feeling very lacking with money. And so I became a perfect mirror for her of a possibility of making money and she wasn't ready to receive it and she lashed out. So it's not personal at all. It never is. Nothing is personal. Everything is, all those types of things are projections. People are projecting their shit onto you. Um, and so here's the deal. When you're stepping into a leadership position, sorry, but you have to be willing to accept that people are going to project onto you, period. There's no way of getting around it. People will always project onto you because we're all mirrors for each other. Um, number two is that, and this is what I teach the, the people that I work with, is that the most important quality that you can possess as a leader is compassion. Because here's the deal. The world is full of violence, people fighting each other, people rejecting each other. There's wars between countries doing the same thing to each other. And if you're truly here to lead expansion in the world, if you're truly here to help people, then you have to be the embodiment of compassion. And what that means is when I see that really mean comment, I don't make it about me, get triggered, and then like get into a fight with the person or tell them to F off because they were just a huge jerk to me. Um, that, what is that going to accomplish? That's serving contraction. That's just perpetuating a pattern that that person is stuck in and they're projecting onto me. So for me, I lead much more powerfully if my, if my intention is truly to heal and transform, truly to expand, then I lead more powerfully and I create a transformation when I respond to that person with deep compassion or I don't even have to respond. I can just send them deep love and compassion. So how did you uh, respond to that woman? Did you reply to her at all? Did you block her? I didn't. Her? No, I didn't. I just left it. I sent her a ton of love and I went on with my day. There are some people, there are some people who are repeat offenders and will, and so they're not really interested in conversation or expansion or transformation. They're just looking to dump their stuff onto you. Um, and if it happens repeatedly, then my assistant will block them just because I also view my uh, Facebook group and the places where my people convene as a safe space. And I view myself as the keeper of that safe space. So if somebody keeps doing it, then they're starting to now violate the space for other people. And so that's when they get blocked. But, but honestly, what I do is I, I look at that person and I ask myself, who is that in me? Because we're all reflections of each other. So that woman who left that really nasty comment about money, she's me. Like there is a part of me that is like that. And it's an invitation for me to go deeper and see that part of myself and send it deep love. Because when I do that, she receives the love too. 
Mm, that is really, really fantastic advice. And I so appreciate you sharing because I think a lot of us who are uh, more and more in the public eye, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a learning process to understand and to develop the way that you share with the world. And, you know, there's, um, um, each person has a personal style as well, but also to think, um, about the the audience and those specific points that you shared that's like it's a very powerful approach because i think that it's you know really easy to just um uh without too much forethought um share you know thoughts uh, on facebook and on twitter and most people do that most people who have an account are doing the, these things in you know a social context but as a, a public figure, as a um, media professional, I think there is indeed an extra um, level of responsibility, and that will that does come with a certain um, uh, certain consideration. You know uh, the points that you mentioned. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. And and I just want to add one more thing. In studying leaders and people who've made change in the world. This approach is the only way to keep your business long-term sustainable for you. Because if you let it get to you, every time somebody makes a hate comment, you're going to be destroyed and you won't be able to continue. So we have to cultivate the compassion ability. We have to cultivate the it's not personal ability every day. Because the bigger you get, the more hate mail you're going to get. Because not everybody's going to love you and that's okay. You just have to like build the muscle to be able to see that it's not really about you at all. Thank you. So I'm so curious to ask you about your experience that you shared on your website about how you were able to grow a multiple six-figure coaching business with a list of 500 people and no website. How mm -hmm. were you able to attract 500 hot leads to begin with? Was it through a telesummit launch? I'd love to discover how we might be able to model your success, especially for those entrepreneurs who are just starting out. Sure. So it's so funny because I just taught a class about this a couple days ago to another group of entrepreneurs. So I'll give you all the juicy stuff I gave them. Uh, the most important thing is to be of service and to give value. And that's how I built a uh, six figure business on a 500 person list is that I was always giving value and just giving and giving and giving to my community. And that made them trust me. And they just loved so much all the content they got. I mean, I wasn't giving away like the baby with the bathwater. So it's not like I was just giving them everything away. And then, and then nobody felt the need to work with me because of that. But I was always just giving and giving and giving little tidbits, uh, helpful hints, um, little gifts to my list. And that really builds a really strong rapport and a really loyal community. Um, that's when I was at 500 to get to 500. The first year in my business, again, it's just focused on giving. Um, every single month I did a free teleclass and I would advertise it on Facebook. I would ask friends to post it on their Facebook walls. I mean, everywhere that I could get that teleclass to be put, I would put it. I would paste it on the forum for my coaching school. I would put, paste it in like post it in uh, forums that I belong to on Facebook. The few people that I had on my list, I'd say forward to a friend. And little by little, when I first when I my first style class had like twenty five people sign up, and the actual class date came, and nobody was on the call. So I actually spoke into a recording like by myself, <laughs> pretending like there was people on the call. <laughs> I think everyone dreads that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, part, it's part of the journey. Like that's part of it. So if that happens, you're not a failure. You're, you're on track. Okay. It's, happened <laughs> it's happened to the biggest. <laughs> it's happened to all of us. And mm -hmm. it still happens. Even even when you're really big, I, I just did an event and I I announced it really last minute just as an experiment. And I, I was like, oh, I'll get like 40 people. I got five people. <laughs> and you know what? I didn't care because I was so happy to be able to teach the material I was going to teach. But I was like, cool, it's just going to be a super intimate group. But, you know, even me, like I could only get five people at a short notice on a weird random day, which was when my event was. But, um, yeah, that's how I did it. I did a free teleclass every month. And little by little, people kind of started to find out that this, hey, this girl, Lisa, does this free teleclass every month. And it was a different topic every month. And uh, it started bringing people in. And what's really cool about teleclass is that people can start to experience you 
live over the phone and they really start to feel like what it's like to be around you. They, they start to build trust with you because people aren't going to give you their money until they trust you. I'm not going to just walk up to a random person on the street and be like, here's $5,000. No, I need to know you. I need to know that like you are legit. I need to know that you're in business for longer than three months. Cause what if you like take my money and then your business shuts down? So just being a consistent um, a consistent face in front of your people over and over and over again starts to build trust. And eventually, you know, my teleclasses started to get like 50 people, 100 people, um, 500 people. And now for me, it's just very regular to get between 500 to 1,000 people onto a teleclass. Um, and I only do teleclasses like two or three times a year when I'm launching something now. But if you're really serious, do a teleclass every month. And so how many months did you do your monthly teleclass before you started to, before you had, until you had that list of 500? I would say about a year. It was a year of just consistently, because, you know, teleclasses are great list builders because as you're advertising them, people have to enter their name and email to sign up to be on the teleclass. And if you teach a really kick-ass teleclass and then you follow up with really great content, regularly. That's the other thing. It wasn't just teleclasses. I was regularly sending newsletters out to my community and I wasn't like, Oh, I'll, I'll send one out this month and I'll wait two months and I'll send out another one and then I'll send four in one month and then two another. That feels really inconsistent and like not stable to people. So I was just very consistent. When I first started out, it was once every two weeks, once every two weeks, once every two weeks, like clockwork. Now it's once every week. Um, but yeah, just consistency, consistency, consistency is what starts to build that list. I think your approach is a lot less stressful than hosting a telesummit. <laughs> oh my gosh. You no, know, I do. People have asked me like, why don't you do a telesummit? I'm like, no way in hell. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's... No way in hell. <laughs> yep. 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 I've been there, done that. Yeah. I, I love the kind of like more gradual approach to list building rather than the whole like, you know, take over your life for two to three months and then boom, it's over. Now you need like to totally unplug and <laughs> recuperate. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, <laughs> yeah. And then you don't even have the energy to send emails out after the tell summit because you're so exhausted. <laughs> well, I don't even know. I don't even know if this is true, but I've heard, I've had friends who've done tele summits and gotten like thousands of people for their list, which was awesome. But then they tell me that they're very not, that the list becomes not very responsive. Like, that it's not always the best type of list to have. I'm not I'm not sure if that's the case, but that's what I've been hearing from a lot of people lately. That's interesting. I've heard the opposite. I've heard that telesummit lists are actually warmer because you've positioned yourself with um, 20 other experts, for example. Interesting. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, be good to, to do a little bit more research. So yeah. uh, what you just described to me then, the monthly tel uh, teleclasses and like the regular content and giving value, is this then the secret to creating a tribe of loyal raving f fans that want to participate in every program you create? Or is there more to that? Um, yes, that's one of the secrets. And the other secret is to be authentically you. And I'll tell you why. My people love me. They love me and I freaking love them. Um, like there's real love there and it's because I give everything to my people. Um, and that means I'm writing them like my newsletters to them. I put a good two, three hours into each one every week. Um, because I want to make sure it's just going to rock their world every time I send it out. Um, and I, and you know, based on their feedback, it does. So it's not just like an email, like, Hey, come buy this from me. Cause that just feels like somebody's using you. It's like a really rich email. It doesn't have, if you're not a good writer, it can be a video. It can be an audio. It doesn't have to be written word. And on Facebook, I write content too. So it's, it's different from my newsletter. So they're getting like daily inspiration on Facebook. I have a woman that I hired to do memes for me and she creates these beautiful graphics with my quotes on them for inspiration for people. Um, and the top thing that people tell me, I mean, I get a lot, my audience is very, they love to get, they're just very responsive. So they write in, they, they share how they feel on Facebook because I ask them to. And because I give them so much, they're happy to do that. They're happy to participate. But the top two things they say to me is, number one, you give me so much and you help me so much on a daily basis, whether it be on Facebook or something I stumble across on your website. But number two is, I just love how you own who you are and it's an inspiration for me. And I just want to be around you so that like I can 
do that too. That's the top feedback that I get from my people. So I would say, yes, consistently provide good content to your people and be of service and stop thinking about yourself. And number two, just be you because those are the best types of clients, the ones that you can just be yourself and you don't have to think about what you look like or if you're going to offend them. My people know I cuss. My people know I'm going to call them out on their BS and they freaking love it. And then I don't have to be like spending energy and wasting time being somebody I'm not and being nervous that I'm going to be found out, which lends really into a lot of people have this fear of being found out. They're going to be a fraud. And I don't have that fear because I own all of my flaws and all the stuff that I am on Facebook. And at this point, if anybody wants to be like, I found out that this happened when you were 12, I'll be like, yeah, so what? That did happen to me when I was 12. So vulnerability is true strength and true power, in my opinion. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Gosh, <laughs> I'm so inspired by um, by all your uh, all your wonderful advice, and I can't wait to be able to create a community of people that just where there's so much love circulating. You know, it, it's it's wonderful to be in that place where you can say with complete confidence that you know your tribe totally loves you, and um, and then you love them back. You know. Uh, I think it's um, it's interesting because I think most people end up with a mixed bag. I mean, I would love to say that about most of my tribe, but then occasionally I'll have some folks that, you know, might have hailed from high school, for example, all of a sudden come out with this flaming thing. I'm like, whoa, I didn't know you were so right wing. OK. <laughs> and of course, me being a liberal, you know, so um, it's kind of interesting. But I think that, gosh, you know, I think that's something that we all really long for, too, is to really, truly find our community and to be able to create it. And I think most of us, you know, have a mixed bag of folks within our, you know, communities that, you know, have come from different parts of our lives. And sometimes, you know, we grow in different directions. And, you know, the love that might have been there when you were at, uh, in your teens, you know, may have really shifted as people have grown and values have changed and all of that. So uh, do you find that you actually need to do any culling of people from your community? Um, or is it, you know, have you successfully really just uh, populated your community mostly with people that uh, that are your loyal raving fans? Well, I think that um, the calling kind of like people self-select out the way that I do it because I'm so just like, hey, you know what? This is how I do things. And if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. Like there's just I have that energy and, and it's not like a defensive like FU type of energy. It's like what's done here is fully owned and I've done the work to own that. And if you don't like it, it's fine. I love you. And there's just no place for you here. Um, and so I find that anybody who like doesn't, because, because my message is because I try at least to just be as fully me as possible. Like I will cuss in my newsletters and anybody who would have issues with like me being liberal or cuss immediately unsubscribes and removes themselves. So again, being really clear on who you are and not apologizing for it is the best color of the people that are not aligned with what you're doing, number one. And number two, yes, in the beginning, I did have to um, block some people or um, if people were repeatedly offensive, I would just ban them. Um, and But I mean, I to be honest with you, I haven't really had to do that too much. And people who have issues with it, let's say if it's like a family member, obviously I can't ban a family member, but <laughs> if it's a family member, they've just kind of stopped pestering me because I, I'm not going to stop. <laughs> like they can say all they want and I, you know, love you, but this is what I believe and I'm going to keep doing it. So after a while, they just realize that like their, their words are just having no effect on me. So they just give up or number two, they just realize that, you know, because, because, I try to approach it with compassion. There's no reactive need to keep pushing on me. It's like, I love you. I see where you're coming from. I'm sorry you feel that way. This is what it's like for me. And we can both agree to disagree. Um, that seems to calm people down a lot. Um, I did have an incident recently where a woman on my Facebook page commented under one of my pictures uh, because I guess I was smiling with my teeth in a picture. And I, and I guess I didn't know this, but I guess I don't smile a lot with like a big toothy smile normally. And she wrote, <laughs> she wrote, 
you need to smile more. Otherwise, you just look pissed off in all your pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, wow. And I, I saw, I was like, at first I got triggered and I'm like, what the hell? Like, why am I being judged? For <laughs> yeah, <smile?"> right. <laughs> uh, but then I was like, wait, no, you're supposed to be embodying compassion and you're supposed to be really seeing the person and seeing their pain. So people only propagate pain when they're experiencing pain. So I, I read her comment and I went, oh, you know what? She probably, people have probably told her that she needs to smile more and she probably has shame over, um, not like being a certain way because people keep pushing her to be that way. And so I wrote back to her and I said, thank you so much for your perspective and, and thank you for commenting on my photo. And I said, you know, when I experience your comment, I experience it like you're trying to ask me to be somebody that I'm not. And I'm curious if that's how you meant the comment. Um, and she said, she said something like, well, you know, I just think that you should smile more. You look prettier when you smile. And I said, I understand. Um, but I wonder if there's a trigger in here for you because I'm just, you know, I have many different types of smiles and I'm not <laughs> like thinking about how I'm smiling when somebody's taking a picture of me. I'm just smiling <laughs> naturally. I'm not doing like the fake smile thing. And, um, and she wrote back and she went, oh, my God. And I said, I wonder, like, what I am mirroring back to you here. And she wrote back and she said, you know what? For the past week, everybody's been telling me I should be some way that I don't want to be. And I just realized that I did the same thing to you. I'm so sorry. And it was like this really amazing transformational moment. So I just think there's many ways to approach it. But the, the main thing I would say is that. Um, just be compassionate and just see the person's pain and understand it has nothing to do with you. And yes, yeah, sometimes you will have to set very clear boundaries with people and say, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to block you. Or if it's a family member, I'll say, the way that you're speaking to me is really affecting our relationship negatively. And if you continue to do this, it's unfortunately, I'm going to have to set heavier boundaries in place, which will affect our connection. And that will make me very sad but it's what I'm going to have to do. And I find that when I say it that way, people respect it. Beautiful, clear, compassionate, and firm. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, part of being authentic um, is really, I believe, is understanding what your purpose is in the world. And I uh, notice that you help entrepreneurs discover their purpose um, and you can help them discover their purpose in four steps. Would you be willing to share that with us? Hmm. In four steps. Where did you get that? I'm curious. I think off your web, your website, <laughs> okay. how to find um, your purpose in four steps. I mean, if that's evolved since then, um, oh, that was an article I wrote. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so, so here's the deal with purpose. And, and I find that my views on purpose evolve constantly. Um, I don't, I, you know, I think purpose is something that a lot of people spend a lot of time and money trying to find. And I think that purpose actually can only be found in the doing. And what I mean by that is um, I work with so many entrepreneurs who have spent months and months and months thinking about what their purpose is and not releasing or actually like putting any work out into the world because they want to make sure what they're putting out there is aligned with their purpose. But the way purpose has worked for me is that Purpose just gives me little hunches and little ideas. So purpose told me sign up for the coaching school, even though my ego was saying, well, this may not work or yeah, do this to make money. That was what my ego was saying. Right. But my purpose was going, giving me this deeper nudge of like, just sign up. You'll see why. And then my ego said, oh, do emotional eating. Cause that's what that's popular right now. And that'll make you a lot of money my soul and my purpose said, you know, give your all to these people that you're talking with. And so my purpose nudges me gently forward to try different things. And I think the difference between people who never do anything versus people who succeed is that they don't wait to figure out exactly what their purpose is before they start. They start anyway, and they let the purpose sort of unravel itself as they go along. And that's what I have found has been my journey. 
you know, I really, truly know that I'm definitely in my purpose right now. And at the same time, I know that my purpose is evolving as I speak. So in two years from now, my message might be different. But that doesn't mean I'm stepping into a different purpose. Your purpose is not what you do. Your purpose is not your job title. Your purpose is something that you do when you are watering your plants, when you're eating, when you're talking to the stranger on the street, when you're breathing, when you're talking to your clients, when you're reading a book. Like your purpose is the embodiment of you in every moment. So instead of waiting to like find your purpose, just start following the little hunches you get and trust because those little, that doing starts to reveal other steps that you wouldn't have seen unless you took that first step. And then you can, you're like, oh, I can take these two steps in this direction. And then you take the steps in that direction. And then all of a sudden, a whole other landscape opens up that you can only see from that vantage point of having taken those two extra steps. Um, so don't try to like figure out what your purpose is. Just follow your hunches and do, 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 do. Because almost like 90% of the answers you're looking for are in the doing. So that's my like upgraded, evolved view of purpose and your purpose reveals itself to you as you go along and it's not your job title. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I love um, what you just said about purpose being um, uh, coming to live and uh, coming alive in action because you know indeed you can spend a lot of time doing formal exercises to identify what your purpose is but you won't truly know unless you get out there and do it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I just remembered what you meant by the four steps. So that's actually part of my program, Impact. Oh, um, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so what I would say is, what I always tell people to ask themselves, if you truly feel like you have absolutely no clue, um, there a lot of clues lie in your childhood. So um, I ask people questions like, so I would, I would ask you to ask yourself, what did I most love to do as a child? Um, what is something that when I was little, I would just get lost in for hours and hours? Um, you could ask yourself also a third question would be, what are the qualities that I most admire in the people that I follow? So like if you really love, um, you know, Marie Forleo or something, then what are the qualities in her that you really admire? Because very often those are clues reflecting something back to you that you wish to embody right? So that can connect you to your purpose. And then another question to ask yourself is, what are things that now as an adult, I could, uh, that if I got paid to do them, I would feel almost guilty because it's so much fun and so easy to do them. So you would advise or, or um, invite people to ask themselves those specific questions? Yeah, ask yourself those questions. And what I find is in the answers, as you start to look at your answers to each question, there's more questions, of course. And, you know, this is something that really has to be on an individualized basis because everybody's so different. But, um, you know, ask yourself at least to start those four questions, because as you start seeing the answers, you'll start to find connecting threads. And there's a lot of little ahas just in your answers as you start to see how they connect with each other. So you may find connections between what you used to love to do as a child and what you love to do now um, and start thinking about the qualities that the leaders that you admire have. And that can start to create a picture for you as to what direction you may want to head in. But honestly, that's like a more logical approach. I also really believe in what I said, which is if you have a hunch, follow it, see what happens. I love it. Thank you. So we're coming about to the end of our interview segment. I'd love to leave you with this last favorite question of mine. Lisa, what do you think is the most effective way to change the world? Hmm. The most effective way to change the world is to do the inner work on yourself because you are the world and the world is you. There's no separation. Um, so if you work on yourself, if you work on being more authentic, more compassionate, more vulnerable every day, then that's exactly what you're going to see reflected in the outer world. Thank you so much. How can we best stay in touch with you, Lisa? Uh, you can find me on my website, lisafabrega.com, um, L-I-S-A-S-A-B-R-E-G-A.com. 
Um, and if you want to shoot me a note in terms of uh, any question you might have or or any want to share how this affected you, you can email uh, support at lisafabrica.com. And uh, I have an amazing team member, Michelle, who is fabulous. And she will receive your email and forward it to me. Thank you so much, Lisa. You have a beautiful day. You too. Thank you, Lorna. Thanks, folks, for listening to the Entrepreneurs for Change podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please help us reach more people with inspiring stories like this one by giving us a five-star rating in iTunes. If this podcast inspires you to join the movement of change-making entrepreneurs, we'd love to give you a jumpstart with our free Business Changemakers Toolkit, which you can download at www.entrepreneursforachange.com slash join. If you have a change maker in mind you'd love for us to interview, go to entrepreneursforachange.com slash suggest and tell us who and why. Finally, feel free to stop by facebook.com slash entrepreneursforachange to share your thoughts and say hello. 